story time. I was around 13 and very experienced by then in the woods and as a hunter. My family dropped me off on the opposite portion of the hunting land we were leasing in South Georgia, USA. At over 1,000 acres of timber they could not even hear me shoot where most people were hunting. I was dropped off in the darkness over an hour before sunrise so that I could hike the mile to the deer stand. As I stood in the darkness to allow my eyes to adjust I could hear a pack of feral dogs yipping and howling as if they were chasing a deer. I was making my way quickly down my trail and noticed that the dogs were getting closer. I thought to myself that if I felt they were closing in on me that I would get up an old rotten stand midway to where I hunted. If they were a deer they would run past my position and if not they would scatter trying to find my trail. The sounds of the pack intensified and it sounded like they were at the road where I was dropped. I hurried to the midpoint and could tell they had picked up their pace. I scurried up the makeshift ladder and got into the stand with my heart pounding. Then the most chilling thing occurred, they fell silent. I stood in that stand with my heart pounding straining to listen for their approach. Suddenly they were there bursting from brush around the trail. In total I would say there were over a dozen dogs of various breeds that had gone feral. No collars on any of them. They stopped and fanned out sniffing once my trail was broken. I slowly turned and shifted my stance to get into a firing position. Since these dogs were clearly hunting me they were a hazard to anyone in the woods. I started to raise my rifle when a very large chow chow looked up and started growling. The pack all started barking as the chow snarled and kicked dirt around it. This made it clear who was going to go first. My first show was true and killed the chow instantly. I immediately went to work to take out as many as I could. The pack immediately ran the opposite direction and headed to even heavier brush and young pine trees. They melted into the forest rapidly and as I fired many shots were blocked by small trees. I was only able to take a few more of the pack out but I think I made my point as we did not encounter any further sign of them on the property. It was probably 15 minutes before I stopped shaking from the encounter. After I calmed down enough to climb down I was still stunned with processing what had just happened. I continued onto my deer stand and was able to harvest a doe and met my family at the road at my pickup time. I was out bootpacking above the tree line, had a few friends with me. This was when snowboarding was my career. We were riding down to the bottom, ended up going through the trees and came up on a closed piece near the bottom. Saw a small kicker, jump, and hit it with far too much speed as I was excited. Landed and couldn't turn quickly enough and rode off a cliff. It was near vertical with large rocks protruding that were mostly covered in snow. I fell about 10 meter before I even touched the cliff, then as I hit the cliff face I was falling through very loose powder and bashing rocks, still upright, with my snowboard. My board got snagged on a rock and I leant back and came to a stop. There was easily another 30 meters below me before it started to run out. I wasn't hurt, but I was stuck. My board was wedged and it was the only thing holding me down. I saw a friend who was at the back of the pack ride past further down the trail as it snaked into view and the back out of view again. I yelled like crazy and he paused then just rode off even though I was still yelling him. So I was on my own, no signal, no way of communicating, radio left in my bag at the top of a lift we often use. Took me about 10 minutes to decide to chance it. I started waiting one leg to see if my board would slip. It didn't. I unstrapped one foot, twisted my strapped in leg 180 and kicked around to find footing and leaned my hand on the underside of an exposed rock. I found it eventually and tried to free my snowboard. I gradually climbed out. As the top of the cliff was fairly rounded off it got easier as there was more snow so I could kick my snowboard in and kick a hole for my other foot. Had to have a word with myself after that as I'd kept myself and others safe for years riding back country and I nearly feel to a severe injury right next to a closed piece because I was complacent.
I was turkey hunting once on some land my aunt's family owns and when I was walking through the woods I noticed an area about 6 by 6 that had maybe 50 little red flags stuck in the ground. When I came out of the woods I asked my uncle about the little flags and he said that a guy killed a girl in the 80s and left her body in that spot. Those were the little police evidence flags I was seeing. It was creepy more than anything. When I was 8 or so my dad and I went fishing while camping at a pretty well-known river but is infamous for being extremely dangerous. While fishing on the side of this river sitting by a rocky cliff side. We suddenly hear rushing water, I look at my dad and instinctively start running up this cliff side and get behind a massive boulder and my dad follows me. Instantly a wave of water hits the boulder, separates and goes around the boulder. The water rushes down the cliff side wipes out all our fishing gear and goes into the main river. My dad and I sit there behind the boulder for hours while being surrounded by this rushing water. Eventually it gets to a point where we can hop from big rock to big rock while avoiding getting swept by the still rushing water. We go to the park ranger's office and my dad gives them an earful. Apparently they open the dam and we happen to be at the base of that opening. No signs, sirens, or other indicators or them releasing the dam or bong a restricted area. We were in the heart of the Wildflecken, Germany, on a field training exercise, FTX, with the German military. It was one of those moments where nature decided to make its presence felt in the most unexpected way. I was a young private, eager to prove myself, but I never anticipated the encounter that was about to unfold. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows over our camp, I found myself needing to relieve myself. I sauntered away from the group, my trusty Humvee standing sentry nearby. The woods were eerie, the silence only broken by the rustling of leaves and the occasional hoot of an owl. I was doing my business, taking a moment to appreciate the peace, when something caught my eye. My stream abruptly ceased as I turned my head. There, not more than 50 feet away, was a sight that sent a chill down my spine. A wild boar, with tusks easily 6 inches long, stood there, glaring right at me. My heart raced as the boar began to snort menacingly, its demeanor turning increasingly aggressive. There was no mistaking the threat in its stance. My mind raced as I considered my options. Panic was not an option, the last thing I needed was to be known as the guy who got mauled by a boar while taking a leak. With a calmness that surprised even me, I swiftly tucked away my private mail part, circled around my trusty Humvee, and took off. I could feel the adrenaline surging through my veins as I sprinted away from that boar at a high rate of speed. The thud of my boots on the forest floor seemed to echo in my ears as I looked over my shoulder to make sure the boar wasn't closing in. I couldn't help but curse my luck. Boars, as I would later learn, are not the docile creatures that some people might think. They can easily weigh over 200 pounds and are known to charge at the drop of a hat, seemingly for no reason at all. It's amazing how something so seemingly innocuous could become so menacing in an instant. As I finally rejoined my comrades, out of breath and a little shaken, I recounted my close encounter with the wild boar. Laughter erupted among my fellow soldiers, and my nickname, Boar Bait, was born. It was a badge of honor I would carry with me for the rest of my time in the military, a reminder that even in the most routine moments, the unexpected can happen, and survival depends on quick thinking and a fast pair of legs. Damn boars. This incident took place in November 2013 in Cherokee County, Texas near Lake Stryker. I lived in a cabin and the surrounding land was owned by a fish and game club since the 1940s. My closest neighbor was an older man who had lived most of his life on this property. He would regularly remind me to take a weapon with me when I was hiking. I never paid him too much attention. I decided to go hiking that afternoon. At around 1 p.m. I was headed out the door walking past my neighbor's house and waving at him as I made my way off the trailhead. 
I hung a flag on the post to let people know I was hiking on that part of the property during the hunting season. No flags were on the post when I got there so I know I was the only one on that particular part of the property. I continued on the trail about a mile to the first clearing where I usually crept around a corner before I got there. There may be some deer that I would stop and watch from a distance. This time there were no deer. I started to walk the clearing. The feed plot was set up by the fish and game club and the lake edge was about 200 yards away. Then, the normal animal sounds in the area got deathly quiet. I felt like was being watched by something in the woods, it just doesn't get silent like that. I immediately went on guard. At this point, I was standing in the middle of the clearing away from the tree line. I'll admit, I was scared. I turned around to see if I could retreat back the way I came from because I had no gun or weapon on me. I was ill prepared to defend myself if I needed to. After I turned around I saw that nothing was behind me, but not sure what was watching. I quickly walked back to the tree line. The moment I got back to the tree line facing the direction of the trailhead I heard what sounded like a low grumbling whoop to my right side. I froze, took a second to collect my thoughts, and started to walk right past where the sound came from. It was between me and the house. I made the decision to confront it thinking it may be a black bear. They are rare in this part of Texas but people see them from time to time. I am 6 foot 2 inches tall and this is what you're supposed to do. A black bear, hog, wolf, or mountain lion doesn't make the sound that I just heard. I yelled, hey, this is my hill. Then it stepped out from behind a pine tree about 30 yards to my front and right. It yelled back at me. It was a lot bigger than me. It then took one step over the trail and jumped to the bottom of the wash. I could hear it running on two feet for a few seconds. I ran back to the house. My neighbor said he heard a deep echoing yell before he saw me running home. I was scared out of my mind. I did not go hiking again that year. I believe that it was a Bigfoot. It had auburn brown hair, was seven to eight feet tall, breasts, and large canine teeth. It looked like what would fit the traditional description of a Bigfoot from the other stories I have heard. Because of the breasts, I assume it was female. Was it protecting territory? Were there younger Bigfoot in the vicinity? My neighbor told me that he had seen a Bigfoot in the area before, but not for several years. He was concerned that I would encounter a hog or more common animal on the trail. Back in 2015, our small village of Clino, Argentina had several reported sightings of a winged humanoid creature. The local citizens reported sightings of a strange humanoid creature appearing in the middle of the night and then mysteriously disappearing. Reports of the creature spread quickly to local police who investigated but found nothing. Later, a fireman and friend, C.S., and his police colleague were leaving the headquarters when they spotted in the street at night a strange black hooded figure that matched the sighting's descriptions. The mysterious entity stood still and then suddenly vanished into the shadows. They followed the being until they saw it next to a tree. The figure was looking directly at them. It didn't watch them for too long. Seconds later the figure opened its wings and flew away. My friend described the winged humanoid as 6 feet in height, very skinny, dark colored, with a wide wingspan of approximately 15 feet. The wing structure was like that of a large bat. The eyes were large and flashed beams of light intermittently. The police later asked for help from the community to locate the mysterious entity. There were no other reports made public until recently. About two weeks ago, a visitor to our village reported a similar winged humanoid. He was stopped at a petrol station along Ruta 60 in the village when this creature perched on the station canopy. The witness stated that another patron was there and witnessed the creature. The incident was reported to the police. I was told that the other witness was later interviewed. I will keep you updated on the investigation and whatever media reports come forward. Thank you. In the summer of 2012, a friend and I were in Algonquin Provincial Park. 
We were canoeing along the shore of Smoke Lake. It was quiet, no birds, nothing. And then I tap my friend on the shoulder and I say, don't say anything, but look up above you. This was only about 40 feet above us. We could see every detail of these things. They were three huge birds, possibly thunderbirds, and they had beaks on them that were at least three feet long and a wide wingspan. They looked like small planes. They all flapped their wings at the same time and you would just hear a swish noise. I didn't want to make any noise in case they saw us and came down at us. As we watched, the three birds vanished, as if they flew into an invisible doorway. We were totally shocked. After that, I started seeing and experiencing so many strange things. I was coming home near Barrie, Ontario from a friend's place. It was 11.30 at night. I wasn't drinking or anything, just drinking coffee. I saw, what I thought was, a child. I thought, what's going on? It's 11.30 at night? It's walking ahead of me to the right on this country road. So I drove up and realized that it was a little furry upright creature. It was covered in fur from its head to toes, and small ears. I believe that it was a juvenile Sasquatch. The reason I saw it so well, I drove right up to it. I had my high beams on and mounted spotlights. I could see it perfectly, and I kept bumping it with the truck, not hard to hurt it, but I wanted it to turn around so I could see its face. It wasn't acting scared at all. I bumped into it four or five times, enough to make it turn around. Finally, it did. It had two rows of teeth with large canines. It also had cat-like eyes. It started to walk off the road. Now there were no ditches, no shrubbery, nothing. There was a farm near there. It started walking off the road and into a portal. Not like the portals you see on science fiction shows. I couldn't see any ripples. This thing just walked straight through and vanished. After that, I have seen people and animals simply disappear in front of my eyes. It's been 10 years of constant unexplained encounters with people or weird animals. Each time they vanish, not returning or being seen by me again. Why is this happening? My dad worked in the timber industry his whole life. His father was a logger, and he grew up in and around the woods. My dad started his own logging company when he was 18, and has owned and operated shake and shingle mills from Oregon clear up to Thorn Bay, Alaska. He is an intelligent man and holds over a dozen patents for various pieces of equipment he has designed and built over the years. He has employed dozens of people over the years, all of them spending extensive time in the wilderness. When I was a boy, I remember hearing bits and pieces of conversations among some of the men at the mill. Although nobody would tell me directly, I understood that something had gone on before I was born, and it involved one of the foremen, John. They weren't joking around, they were genuinely afraid, and wouldn't talk about it with a kid. When I was young, my dad wouldn't tell me about it because I would often go out into the woods cutting blocks with him on the weekends, and he didn't want me to be afraid of the woods. While I was speaking with him last weekend, I told him of a couple of strange events that happened to me later in the wilderness, and that reminded me of the hints at a story I heard when I was a boy. After some prodding he told me the following story. In the mid-1960s, my dad owned a large roofing product mill in Aberdeen, Washington. He had teams of men that would cut the fallen old-growth cedar salvage left after a logging operation. He had permits to salvage a large amount of wood in the coastal areas of Grays Harbor County, primarily in the area around Capalis Beach. Several of the men on his cutting crews lived in and around Capalis Beach. His foreman, a man I will call John for the story, was a bright, down-to-earth hard worker. My dad trusted him with thousands of dollars of vehicles and equipment, as well as the safety of his crews. He was not the kind of man to make up stories. On a Monday morning sometime in July, John was several hours late for work. This was highly unusual as he was always there early, getting the saws and trucks ready for the day. My dad said he was visibly shaken up, and when he asked him what was wrong, he asked my dad to go in the office so the others wouldn't hear them. 
They went in and sat down, and John simply said something destroyed our house this weekend. My dad thought he said someone broke into the house, and asked John if it was someone he knew. John said, you don't understand, this wasn't a person. It was a. I don't know what it was, but it completely trashed the house. The family is going to stay with my brother in Elma for a while. My dad asked him to explain what had happened. John said that when he got home from work Friday evening, his youngest son Tim, who was around four at the time, told him he saw a big cowman walking at the edge of their field that afternoon. He thought the boy meant cowboy, because some of his neighbors wore cowboy hats when they were out in the sun. He asked him if the man was wearing a cowboy hat, and the boy said, no daddy, he was a cowman, furry and stinky like the cows. He asked his wife if she knew what he was talking about, and she said Tim was playing on the porch that afternoon, when he came running in and said the cowman was stuck on the fence. He was very excited, so she went out to see what he was talking about. She said as she opened the door, she was hit by a horrible smell, like wet dogs and garbage. Tim was pointing across to the field opposite their house and said, he got loose. She looked where he was gesturing and could see the top strand of barbed wire bouncing up and down, as if somebody had just pulled on it really hard and let it go. She didn't see the cowman, and noticed nothing out of the ordinary except for the smell. She told Tim to come inside to play for rest of the day, she felt uneasy and a little scared. Their older son, John Jr. who was 12 at the time, was at a friend's house and walked home a short while after Tim saw his cowman. He told her somebody had followed him home, walking in the woods off the right side of the road. He never seen who it was, they never left the woods, but he said it had to be a really big man. He would hear large sticks cracking, and the footsteps were very heavy. Once he got to the driveway of their house where the wood stopped at the field where his brother had his sighting, the footsteps stopped and John Jr. never saw anything. He was pretty shaken up by the event, and wanted his dad to go out to the woods and check it out with him. Later that evening, John strapped on his .357 and took his older son out into the field to have a look. They first walked to the area where the cowman was supposedly stuck on the fence, and walked down the fence line looking for anything. They came upon a large clump of long, reddish-brown hair tangled in the top strand of barbed wire. He tried to pull it off but it was really tangled up, so he pulled out his buck knife and sawed it off. He said the hair was over a foot long, real coarse and stringy. There appeared to be a bit of flesh matted in the clump, and the top wire was pulled loose from one of the posts. Whatever was hung up on the fence was very big. He handed the hair to his son to hold, and they climbed through the fence and walked toward the woods. He said he was looking for any sign of tracks on the ground, the hair kind of looked like it was from a horse's mane or tail. The ground was a solid grassy field, and there were no hoof prints or any other tracks he could see. The edge of the woods began about 10 feet from the fence line, and they entered on a small game trail that deer frequented. It was around 8 at night, and in the woods it was getting to be fairly dark. They walked for a ways, and soon began to smell the rotting garbage or wet dog odor his wife reported earlier. John said he got the feeling they were being watched, the hair on the back of his neck was standing up. He told his son they should head back before it got dark, and the boy didn't argue. As they began walking back out, they could hear heavy footsteps off to their left. They stopped, and the footsteps stopped. They walked on nearly to the clearing, and John whispered to his son to run like hell to the house on the count of three. John Jr. nodded, and John whispered, one, two, three, and gave his son a push in the back to get him started, then spun around and raced off the trail in the opposite direction toward the footsteps with his gun drawn. Off the trail, the underbrush was dense with ferns and bushes, he had a hard time making headway. But as he got closer, he could hear it moving away from him, deeper into the woods. At this time, he told my dad that he thought it was a vagrant camping out in the woods and possibly scoping houses out to rob at night. 
John was a big man and capable of taking care of himself in most any situation and he had a large caliber handgun so he wasn't too worried about confronting a vagrant in the woods. He was a few yards off the trail in deep brush when he heard the movement stop just ahead of him. He stopped to look and listen, and thought he saw movement by a large tree, like someone was trying to hide there. He leveled his gun and said come out nice and slow or I swear to God I'll come back there and shoot you. It was silent for a moment, and then he caught movement out the corner of his eye and spun around to his right for a better look. He said it looked like a huge bear moving through the brush, he could only see bits of it through the dense ferns, but it was moving quietly away from the tree on four legs. It was about 15 feet away from him. At first he thought it was a bear, and then suddenly he saw a huge hairy arm with a human-like hand reach out of the brush and grab a small alder tree. The tree was about 4 inches in diameter, and it grabbed hold about 5 feet up. He said it happened so fast it was a blur, but the thing pulled itself upright out of the brush by holding the tree. It stood on two legs and turned its upper body to glare at John. It was enormous, he couldn't believe how bulky it was. He said it was well over 7 feet tall, and at least half that big through the chest. It was too dark to make out many features, but its eyes seemed to glow a deep red, and he thought he could see teeth, like it was curling its lips back. It stood for just a brief moment, and then lunged ahead, pushing back on the tree with tremendous force. The tree snapped loudly and crashed into the trees around it, getting hung up in the branches and not falling to the ground. It then disappeared into the deep brush with frightening speed, sounding like a bulldozer with no engine sounds. John stood there in shock, his gun temporarily forgotten, and then he realized it was heading toward the house, the way his son had went. He turned and ran to the trail, hoping to gain ground on it and cut it off before it reached the clearing. He hit the trail and ran as fast as he could toward the clearing, all the while hearing the creature thrash through the brush on his side. He burst into the clearing and looked frantically about for his son. John Jr. was standing just inside of the fenced field, waiting for his dad. John screamed at him to run to the house, then he saw the thing crash out of the woods about 50 feet to his left. It crossed the 10-foot clearing and stepped over the fence in two strides, and was running through the field parallel to his son in a matter of seconds. John screamed at his son to run faster, and took aim at the creature. He didn't fire because he was afraid to hit his son or his house, so he vaulted over the fence and ran in pursuit of them. He could see it angling toward his son, and knew there was no way his boy would make it to the gate before it cut him off. In desperation, he pointed the gun to the ground at his side and fired as he ran, hoping to scare it. It veered more sharply toward his son, and put on an enormous burst of speed. He heard his boy scream as they seemed to collide, he saw the creature dip its shoulder down a little bit and suddenly John Jr. was airborne, he flew about 10 feet then hit the ground rolling. The creature never paused, it continued to run at an amazing speed in a loop back towards the woods. Once the line of fire was clear, John stopped and squeezed off the remaining 5 rounds of the retreating creature. He was pretty sure all the shots went wild, the creature never made a sound or slowed down and was soon over the fence and back in the woods. He reached his son, who was shaken up but not physically hurt. He asked his dad, if it was a bear. Apparently, little John was so busy running for the house that he didn't see the creature running after him. He said something big and black suddenly ran into him, and he felt a huge paw hit his bottom and he said he felt like he was falling. John pulled his son to his feet and they ran through the gate and into the house locking the door behind him. They were both out of breath and white as ghosts, his wife was screaming at him, demanding to know what the gunshots were for and if they were alright. When he could catch his breath, he told her to make sure the back door was locked, he was going to call the sheriff. He went to the phone and began to dial the number, this was before 911, then stopped and wondered what exactly he was going to say. He hung up the phone, realizing what an idiot he would look like if he told the sheriff the boogeyman just chased them out of the woods. He told his wife that it was a large animal, possibly a bear. He didn't know how to begin to tell her their four-year-old was right, 
His cowman was real and it was more frightening than anything he could imagine. He told them all to keep the doors locked, and stay away from the windows. Around 10 o'clock that night, both boys were in bed and John and his wife sat down to watch the news. They soon heard a loud moaning cry, kind of like the siren on the volunteer fire department. It would stretch out for a long time, and then end with a whoop whoop sound. It was coming from the woods opposite the house. His wife asked what the hell is that? John answered truthfully, that is Tim's cowman. He then described to her the full details of what had happened, and she immediately wanted to call the sheriff. He persuaded her that they would sound crazy, and that he would handle it himself. She reluctantly agreed, and told him she didn't want either of the kids to go outside until this thing was gone. The howling went on until around midnight, when it got quiet again. John wanted to stay up through the night and watch over the house, but he had a long day at work and the excitement earlier had worn him out. They went to bed around 1 in the morning, and had no further problems that night. They slept in that morning, and the boys were already up and watching cartoons when they got out of bed. The first thing little John said was that he had heard the bear rubbing against the house last night. He said he was too scared to get up and tell his parents, and fell back asleep soon after. Then Tim said the cowman talks funny. This stopped John cold. He asked his son when did you talk to the cowman? Tim replied last night, in my room. John asked, the cowman was in your room? No daddy, he's too big for my room, he talked to my window, Tim said, and turned back to the cartoons. What did the cowman say, Tim? John asked. He talks funny, I don't know what he said. He talks like this. Ooh ah 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 ooh, Tim said, and started making strange monkey-like noises. Did the cowman try to get in your window? John asked, breaking out in a cold sweat. He's too big for that. He made funny faces, he has Lincoln log teeth, Tim said with a smile. John later learned Tim meant it had square teeth that looked the same size as the small blocks in a Lincoln log set. It apparently spent quite a while talking and making faces outside the boy's window. Tim said it lay down and went to sleep outside, and he could hear it snoring. John walked to his younger son's room, and cautiously peered out the window. No sleeping cowman. John told the boys to get dressed, they were going to go visit their uncle in Elma for the day. After his wife and kids left, he called one of the men from his crew, and asked him to come over. I'll call him Patrick, he was an ex-state patrolman and my dad said he was kicked off the force because of his drinking problem. He was a good worker and never got drunk before dark, so John figured they would have most of the day to look for this thing. When Patrick arrived, John greeted him at the door and said, are you up for some hunting? Seeing how it was not hunting season, Patrick told him he doesn't poach, and doesn't even want to know about it if John did. John told him it wasn't deer he was after, and went on to explain the previous night's events. Patrick didn't really believe him, but could see he was sincere and still shook up. John had his pistol and a bolt action 30.06, Patrick had a .38 in his car and John loaned him a 12 gauge. They first circled the house looking for any signs of a nocturnal visitor. At the back of the house, there was a spigot for the garden hose, and it always leaked. There was a patch of ground-worn bare of grass under it, and it had turned to mud. In the center of the mud, there was a huge, clear imprint of what looked like a bare human foot. John said it was at least 18 inches long, and very wide. It was so clear that he got the feeling it was left there on purpose. They found no other prints around the house, and in places in the field and woods where a track could be made, the creature seemed to avoid them. Off to the side of the track in the mud were four straight lines about eight inches long. He said it looked like someone had raked their fingers through the mud. When they circled around the side of the house and got to Tim's window, they saw what it was for. Above the top of the window, a good seven feet up, were four muddy streaks. And on the window itself were dozens of large, muddy fingerprints. The glass wasn't cracked or broken, just smeared with mud. By this time Patrick was fast becoming convinced something strange had indeed happened the night before. 
Before going out into the woods, John wanted to feed the family's pigs. They had two of them apparently fairly young weighing around 40 pounds each. The pig pen was about a hundred yards away from the house, behind an old barn. As they got closer John became concerned because they couldn't hear them making any noise. Usually they squealed like crazy when they knew food was near at hand, but this morning it was completely silent. They rounded the corner and the pen was empty. No sign of damage or struggle, the pigs were just gone. They searched the barn but found nothing out of place, so they decided to hit the woods and try to kill this thing. They entered on the same trail John and John had used the day before, John showed Patrick the broken fence wire and told him again about the hare. It was a bright summer morning, and John was surprised at the difference from the previous evening. The night before had been still and silent, now the woods were alive with birds and small animals. He showed Patrick the broken tree, and they followed the creature's trail and found several more trees and large branches twisted and broken. They could see large, faint impressions of footprints where the ground was soft. They followed the deer trail further into the woods, and encountered nothing unusual. By noon they were both getting hungry, so they hiked back to the house for lunch. They spent the rest of the day poking around, but saw nothing more out of the ordinary. Just before dark that night, his wife and kids drove up. He and Patrick were sitting on the porch with the guns, watching the woods. His wife asked if they had seen anything, John told her about the footprint and mud on the window. Patrick had retrieved a pint of booze from his car and was well on his way to getting smashed. John decided he didn't want a frightened drunk with a gun around his family, so he suggested that Patrick could go home, nothing was going to happen anyway. Patrick agreed and drove off, and John continued to watch the woods. His wife brought out a plate of food and a Coleman lantern and a flashlight. He told her he would stay out here and watch the house through the night. Before they went to bed, he went into their bedroom and with help from his wife, pushed the king-sized bed as far from the windows as they could. They agreed that his wife and kids would all sleep in that bed for the night and he would keep watch around the house. She had grown up hunting and knew how to handle a gun as good as him, so she insisted on keeping the shotgun in the room with them. He agreed after making her promise to ask for a name before shooting anything. If it replied John, please don't shoot it. There was a full moon that night, and John could see across the field and into the inky dark of the woods. The night air was filled with the sound of thousands of crickets, and the pond behind the house was full of croaking frogs. As the moon rose higher, clumps of weeds in the field began casting sinister shadows, and before long John was seeing big hairy creatures sneaking up on him in each of them. He stood up and lit a cigarette, trying to shake the fear and concentrate on the task at hand. As he smoked, he wandered to the end of the porch, and stood looking at the darkened barn. Something was different, but he couldn't quite place it. The front of the barn facing the house was open, and the moonlight was hitting it from the side, casting the interior in deep shadows. He stood watching the black opening as he finished his smoke, thinking about the missing pigs. He then realized what was wrong. All the crickets and frogs had gone silent. It was as quiet as the inside of a mausoleum at night, he could hear the minute shrill buzz of his own nervous system. As he turned to walk back to his chair, he thought he saw movement in the barn. He looked intently at the opening and could make out nothing, then turned his head a bit to the side and saw what looked like two red eyes hovering about eight feet off the ground. He couldn't see them if he looked straight at them but when he averted his eyes a little, they became clearer. They were a deep burning coal red, almost invisible in the dark. Every few seconds they would disappear when the creature blinked. His heart began thudding in his chest, and he waited for it to leave the barn and approach the house. He slowly backed up to his chair, never looking away, and picked up his 30.06. He walked back to the end of the porch and watched and waited. He stood looking at the blinking red eyes for what seemed like hours, and then the eyes blinked out and never came back. He watched intently but could see no movement. He thought for a moment, then grabbed the flashlight and shined it at the barn. The flashlight was too small to penetrate the darkness of the barn from this distance, he had to get closer. 
He was none too keen about leaving the relative safety of the porch and confronting a glowing-eyed monster in his barn, but he was damned if he was going to live in fear in his own house. He left the porch and began slowly working his way toward the barn, taking his time, building his courage up. He got closer and could still see no movement, it had gone further into the dark. He got within 20 feet of the opening, and his flashlight would now penetrate the gloom in the barn. He moved the feeble beam of light over the contents of the barn, an old tractor, an old pickup, boxes and buckets. Too many places for something to hide, even something big. He cautiously walked closer, now shining the flashlight down the barrel of his rifle. He stopped at the entrance and shined the light all over, searching the corners and under the vehicles. He stepped into the barn, every sense straining for sound or movement. He walked around the pickup, tensing for a huge, hairy arm to reach out and grab him at any second. He made his way clear to the rear of the barn without seeing anything, and slowly turned around to leave. He felt both relieved not to have encountered it in the dark barn, and frightened and somewhat confused about where it could have gone. As he was walking out he glanced at the wide stairs leading up into the hayloft and froze. He knew with complete certainty that it had climbed those stairs and was waiting for him to walk out under the hayloft and jump down upon him. He couldn't move, he was literally frozen in fear. He swore he could hear the floorboard softly creak above him as an enormous weight edged stealthily closer to the edge. He stood with his heart pounding in his ears, unable to move or act. Suddenly there was the booming explosion of a shotgun from the house, followed by his wife screaming. His paralysis broke and he bolted out of the barn toward the house, completely forgetting what may have been in the hayloft. As he ran toward the house, he heard an inhuman roar coming from the woods behind the house. It sounded pissed off and in pain. It screamed again and he heard branches breaking as it plowed through the forest, thankfully away from the house. He got to the house and almost knocked down the front door in his hurry to get inside. He ran down the hall to their room and found his family huddled together on the bed, sobbing. One of the windows was blown out, and his wife was still pointing the shotgun at it. When he burst into the room she swung the gun in his direction and screamed and he hit the floor. He waited for the blast but it didn't come. He slowly stood up and she had put the gun down and he went to the bed. He asked her what had happened, but she was too shook up to answer just then. Tim started crying, why did you shoot the cowman mommy, why? John Jr. had his face buried against her shoulder crying. After they calmed down a bit, he told them to get up and follow him. He led them to the living room, then went out the open front door and looked carefully around. He could see no sign of it, all was quiet again. He told them to come out and get in the car. They ran out in their pajamas and piled in the car, he got in and drove them to his brother's house in Elma. On the way there, they had calmed down enough to tell him what happened. She said a couple hours after they went to bed, she finally dozed off. She was awakened by Tim talking to someone, and this bizarre clicking chirping sound. Tim wasn't in the bed, he was standing in front of one of the windows. The moonlight was shining through both windows illuminating the room pretty good, but there was a large shadow, like a tree obscuring the window in front of Tim. She knew there were no trees close enough to cast a shadow, she told to get away from the window. Mommy, listen. The cowman can sound like a bird, Tim said pointing excitedly at the dark figure in the window. Timmy, get away from the window, she said, trying to keep her voice quiet. Right after she spoke, the noises from outside changed, it went from a soft chirping, to a strange gibbering, almost like human speech with an occasional pig-like snort thrown in. At this time, little John woke up and said what is that? Rather loudly. This seemed to incite the creature and it hit the side of the house with its fists hard enough for the walls to tremble. At this, little John screamed and Tim yelled quiet, you're going to scare him away, she yelled at Tim to get away from the window again, and reached up on the headboard and grabbed the shotgun. She got out of the bed and started toward Tim, the creature leaned down and looked straight in the window at her. She screamed and raised the shotgun, afraid to shoot because her son was so close to it. 
she started forward to grab Tim, and there was an explosion of breaking glass, a gigantic hairy arm reached through the window toward her son. She screamed again and fired over Tim's head, blowing out the rest of the window and hitting the creature with .00 buckshot. It jerked backwards out of the window and disappeared into the dark. A few seconds later she heard it screaming in the woods. It was trying to get Tim, it was trying to grab my baby. She started crying again and he comforted her as best he could while driving. They stayed the rest of that night and the following night with his brother's family. He told his brother about it, but could see he didn't really believe him. He agreed to ride back to John's house with him early Monday morning before work. They had left the front door open in their haste to leave, and he was afraid animals or vandals would have got into the house. When they arrived, the house looked like a tornado had gone through it. The couch was upside down. They had a large, heavy console TV and it was apparently thrown across the room, lying in a spray of broken glass. The kitchen was trashed, the refrigerator knocked over and food everywhere. The doors to both of the boys' rooms were left closed, and the rooms were untouched, same as the bathroom. The master bedroom was torn apart, the pillows ripped up and feathers everywhere. The chest of drawers was knocked over and the large mirror smashed. John's brother looked around in awe, and said you better call the police. John looked at him and said and tell them what? Bigfoot destroyed my house? They left and closed the front door this time, and drove to my dad's mill in Aberdeen. John's brother waited in the car while John went in and told this to my dad. After he was done, my dad said, well, let's go have a look at it then. They drove back out to the house, and John showed my dad the damage. He pulled the clump of hair from his shirt pocket and let my dad look at it. As they were walking through the house surveying the damage, my dad pointed out cracks in the ceiling where it had apparently stood up and hit its head. John told my dad that they couldn't live there anymore, even if the creature was gone, they would always be afraid. Their homeowner's insurance wouldn't cover the damage, the adjuster claimed John must have done it in a drunken rage. My dad helped them find a place in Aberdeen, and gave him a loan for new furniture and stuff. The house was eventually fixed up and sold, and my dad never heard about another problem there. A few observations about this story, my dad lost contact with John and his family in the mid-80s. They moved out of state and my dad hasn't heard from them since. His brother died around the same time. Why didn't they call the cops? John had a lot of pride as well as a lot of common sense. He knew he couldn't logically explain what had happened to the authorities, and he didn't want the story to get out and have him branded a nutcase. I asked my dad if they saved the hair, he said John never mentioned it again and my dad never asked him about it. I asked my dad if he saw the footprint and muddy fingerprints, he said he did. He said it looked like a giant barefoot man had stepped very carefully in the center of the mud. He's not a tracker, but he said it was the clearest print of any kind he had ever seen. I asked my dad if the neighbors had heard any of this. He said if they did, none of them ever mentioned it again. I also asked him if he thought it was possible John had made it all up. That he had trashed his house in a drunken rage, and made up this elaborate cover story. My dad said John and his family were terrified of that place, they didn't even want to go back and get their clothes. If was just an elaborate story, what did he stand to gain? To profit from a story in any way, you have to share it with people. My dad and the other folks mentioned in the story are the only ones who ever heard it, until now, of course. He also said that whatever trashed that house was no man. The TV had to have weighed close to 200 pounds and it was obviously thrown across the room with great force. He said that even after two days, there was still a wild animal smell in the house. I asked him if thought there might have been two creatures involved, considering the incident in the barn. He said he asked John that same question, and was told that John felt there was only one, that it lured him into the barn then snuck out the side door to the house. The thing he thought he heard in the hayloft was either his imagination, or some common animal like a raccoon. For whatever reason, this critter seemed focused on their four-year-old son. Their son was the only one who never showed any fear of it. 
he seemed to think of it as his friend. And although the sex of the animal was never determined, it was referred to as a male because of the predatory stalking type behavior. That and the conspicuous lack of breasts, or perhaps it was just not as well endowed as the Patterson film subject? Anyhow, its behavior almost seems indicative of a mother that has lost her little Bigfoot and is looking for a replacement. I rather facetiously asked my dad if little Timmy was a particularly hairy child, perhaps suffering from that rare condition that causes uncontrollable hair growth all over the body. He said Timmy was a normal little boy, with normal brown hair on his normal head. I didn't ask if Timmy regularly reeked of rotting garbage and wet dogs, didn't seem a polite course for the conversation to take. He told me of other possible Bigfoot encounters he and his crews had in the woods around Grays Harbor. None of them are quite as titillating as the cowman story, but interesting nonetheless. Perhaps I'll share them if there is an interest here in them. So in the end I was left with no leads to follow, no new evidence of anything, but I did come away with a pretty damned good story. And I guess that's better than a poke in the eye with a filthy encrusted hypodermic needle. Those of you who actually read this far, I give you a big thumbs up, you are truly an ardent and stoic follower of all things Bigfoot, or like me, recently underemployed and in desperate need to fill the endless empty hours of your life. My husband and I were at the now abandoned Century 3 Mall in West Mifflin, Pennsylvania. I found a bench in the mall for my husband to sit on while I headed to the men's department in J.C. Penney. While I was there, I had a surreal encounter. I spotted a creature that resembled an alien or an extraterrestrial. There was another woman in the area with her young children, and they were hastily leaving. Her son expressed curiosity, saying, I want to see. But the mother firmly replied, no, you can't. Let's go now. I noticed a peculiar, small, gray figure, about four half inches tall, wearing a red or black plaid shirt and blue pants. He was standing near a clothes rack. I briefly observed him from the side and then looked away. When I glanced back, he had turned to face me. I can vividly recall his appearance, a male figure with no hair, gray skin, almond-shaped black eyes, and a heavily wrinkled, lumpy face that appeared far from human, somewhat resembling an insect. Out of politeness, I looked away again, and when I glanced back once more, he had vanished. I decided to approach the register to seek out security, but there was no one around. I wasn't particularly afraid, strangely enough. In fact, the little man had a pleasant smile on his face. Nevertheless, I chose to leave the store as my husband and I had plans to attend a movie. I attempted to tell my husband about the encounter, but he advised me to wait until after the movie. I remember sitting in the dark theater at the back, near the exit door. Every time the door opened, I couldn't help but look to see if the strange creature had reappeared. As time passed, I began to feel increasingly apprehensive. It's astonishing that I completely forgot about the encounter, and I didn't mention it to my husband until two months later when I came across a UFO article in the Tribune Review newspaper. The article somehow jogged my memory. I've always prided myself on my excellent memory and my ability to recall details from years past, so it surprised me that I had repressed this memory. I can't help but believe that the creature's intense gaze had something to do with the memory slipping away. Interestingly, the newspaper article mentioned a UFO sighting in Jefferson Hills, very close to the mall, around the same time I had my inexplicable experience. Since then, I've taken to referring to the enigmatic being as the Cicada Man. There were three of us, Mary, her mother Dorothy, and myself. We were in Cumberland County, Pennsylvania near our homes in Shippensburg. We went shopping at a mall and were returning home. Mary was getting ready to go to nursing school. She was buying a few things, and the stores closed at 9 p.m. We were coming back from and Mary hated driving on Interstate 81 so we always took the rural back roads and it was a perfectly clear night, a million stars visible and some moonlight. 
And it was just, you know, a lovely drive. And, out of nowhere, there were these lights that came up behind us. Mary thought that somebody wanted to pass so she put her arm out and she said, pass. Pass. And she slowed down and they didn't pass. But they were close and it was annoying her, so she stopped the car and she said, I want to find out what is going on. And her mother said, Mary, don't get out of this car. Just stop. Let them go. Ignore them. And she said, no, maybe something's wrong. Ever the caregiver, Nurse Mary. I was in the back seat. I got out of the car as well. Mary was 18 and I was 17. So, I got out of the car and I was on the passenger side of the car. Mary was on the driver's side of the car. She walked to the rear of the car and I was already pretty much there. There was this object. There were no lights this time. When we stopped and got out of the car, the lights were gone. You couldn't even see where there had been headlights or anything, it was perfectly smooth. It wasn't square in shape, it wasn't oblong or like a hot dog or anything like that. It sort of had a rise in the center from the top as though it rose and the bottom appeared to be flat and the sides were curved but very smooth. There was not a sound at all. Not an engine, not a hum, nothing. It was absolutely quiet. I wasn't frightened because we didn't feel threatened. I mean, I actually touched it. I was so fascinated with it because I didn't know what it was made of. In later years I came to realize that it was like titanium. It was perfectly black and the moonlight made it look shiny. Mary started asking, Hello, do you want to talk to us? I'm not afraid. And I said, I'm not afraid either. I said, would you like to speak to us? Would you like to ask us questions? We'd like to ask you questions. Don't be afraid, we're not afraid. We were kids, you know. Now Mary's mother is in the front seat crying hysterically, get in the car. Get in the car. I don't like this, I'm frightened. And Mary's just, ma, shut up. This is the amazing thing, it just lifted straight up without making a sound. It elevated as if to go up and while it was right in front of it, I mean I wasn't a foot from it. I could put my arm out and touch it and it just lifted straight up and just sort of took off. As it took off, lights around it started circling, different colors and we could see people inside and we waved. Yeah, we waved goodbye. They were too far away, but they appeared to be human. They had heads, necks, shoulders, and arms. Mary said, they don't have five fingers. And, see, I wasn't looking at the fingers. We were waving to them saying goodbye and they waved back to us. I know it's somewhat common, and many people have similar experiences, but this is what happened. Yesterday, I bought some new jewelry and had it wrapped up in a paper envelope, which I placed in my tote bag, about the size of a smartphone. As soon as I got back home, I saw the envelope in my tote and remembered thinking, oh, I almost forgot about it. I need to take it out and put it in the jewelry box later on. I left my bag undisturbed in my bedroom, and that was that. One hour later, I opened the tote bag to retrieve the envelope, but it wasn't there. I was confused because I distinctly remembered seeing it and leaving it inside, but it had vanished. I emptied the bag, searched around my room, and ended up looking everywhere in my home for hours. It was gone. I was so confused that I even began to doubt my own memory. I've always had a suspicion, though not certainty, that my house might be haunted, so as a last resort, I said out loud, hey, if anyone out there took it, please give it back. This isn't right. We both coexist here peacefully, and I respect you, but please respect me too, I continued searching, looked at the bag several times, turned it upside down, emptied it completely, and even resorted to shining my iPhone's flashlight inside. Still, there was nothing. I went to bed and woke up this morning. As I was about to leave and reached for the tote bag, which was empty, there it was, right in the middle of the bag. I can't adequately describe how I felt. I was so freaked out that I even shed real tears. It's never happened to me before.
I've been confused and freaked out all day and can't stop thinking about it. It was impossible. I live alone, no one got in, and the envelope was big enough not to be overlooked. I don't know what to do. I'm going crazy. If this is paranormal, I'm freaked out. If this isn't paranormal, I'm still freaked out. I'm in good health and feel fine. People have been trying to calm me down by suggesting it's impossible, and maybe I was so nervous that I simply didn't see it, but I know that isn't true. I don't know what to do. When I was younger, around 11 to 12 years old, I'm now 22, I used to play football with my friends who lived in my neighborhood. We played every night, but our parents would make us come in early because we lived in a poor neighborhood, and the streetlight was always broken, making it too dark. One night, it was fixed, so our parents allowed us to stay out a little longer. Our friends were facing the streetlight and had just drop kicked the ball. We had to retrieve it, and right as we turned around, we saw a man. He was wearing a business suit, a top hat, and carrying a briefcase. Since I live in Arizona, where it can get really hot, and it was over 200 degrees out, it was strange to see him standing there. The streetlight was about 50 feet away, and our house was another 100 feet in the other direction. We started walking towards him, and when we got about 20 feet away, we couldn't see his face, it was just black under the streetlight. He started slowly walking towards us, and we decided to walk away. After about 10 steps, he began sprinting toward us at full speed. We never looked back, we just heard his shoes clacking on the ground. Right as we got to our house, he was about 5 feet away from us. We closed the gate, and he just stopped and stared at us. Every time we told, or tell, our mom about this, she looks shocked, shuts us down, and runs to another room. If anyone knows who or what it was, please tell me. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.